I'm really excited about this morning's service. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, you can go ahead and be opening up somewhere. Oh, uh, let's try, uh, oh, let's go to Romans 12, a verse you've never heard before, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Put a marker in Ephesians 4, and in Hebrews 4, and in Romans 10. <laughs> Well, let me tell you why I'm excited about this. I've, my parents raised me right. I grew up in church. <clears throat> and uh, I thank God for that uh, foundation that I have, even though I was taught a lot of things that weren't right. I, wa I was taught correctly that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus died for my sins, and that through His blood I could be saved. Thank God for that. Amen. So then, in, uh, but a lot of those services, at the end of it, it would be things like, you know, uh, you listen for a whole hour. Well, no, there you listen for 20 minutes. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And uh, at the end of the, you know, if he's going to draw, you know, give a one-sentence conclusion of the message, it was, Gary, you need to walk in more love. You know, and I was too young in those days to go up and slap the preacher. That's what I felt like doing because I was going, you know, I'm, I'm trying to walk in all the love that I know how. How many of y'all are trying to walk in all? Or they'd say, you know, the end of it would be, uh, you need to have more faith. And I'd go, I'd go slap them again. I knew I needed more faith before I came to your cotton pick, till I came to your blessed service. <laughs> I knew that, you know. Or you need to walk better. You know, you, what I mean is you need to walk a more upright life or... The conclusion of them was just do that. And nobody could ever tell me how. And really, uh, I mean, I got a little bit before we came to this church, a few things that Michael Muccio, Muccio had taught us and a few others, but really it wasn't until I, uh, Sue and I began attending here that we began hearing the message that Pastor Dave had so eloquently taught us, you know, and all those series that are out there. And, you know, well, how do you change? How do you become a person, really? That walks in more love, especially. Now, I, I, I pretty well had a handle on how to get more faith. How many of you know how faith comes? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Let's say it a little more. I, I'm an engineer by training. I like things that work. I mean, E equal MC squared, that's great. You know, okay, fine. You know, but an engineer will take that formula and keep messing with it till he says, hey, you know, I think we could build a toaster with that that will help people. <laughs> In other words, I want to get it down to something practical. And, and uh, when we began hearing this message, it was so practical to me. I says, you mean, you mean if I allow myself to sit here and not only read the Word of God, but then allow the Holy Spirit to pray through me what He's actually, one of the things He's doing while I'm praying in other tongues is actually explaining the mysteries of the Word of God to me? See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. A more practical way to say that is, well, faith is when you start believing what God already believes. And God is so good to us. Here in America, most people have five or six translations. We have His Word. This is what God believes. When you start thinking and believing and acting the way he believes, that's called faith. And it changes you. So I knew that reading the Word and finding out what God said was a big part of it, but how, how many of you know we have, the church today is like the Heinz 57, only it's even worse than that. You know, we're split up more than 57 ways. Just look in the phone book under church, it goes on forever, you know. Now we found a new one on our recent vacation. Now we found the, the, fourth, the fourth first church, I think is what Anyway, <laughs> fourth first church. I just can't get over that. Or maybe it was the first fourth church. I don't know. Anyway, it was strange. But Well, why is that? I mean, here you've got all these people that love God and they're trying to understand God. But see, they've got a, a fundamental problem. They're trying to understand the mind of an infinite God. And they're using a, their finite mind trying to understand how he thinks. And that's why, you know, well, I believe God says this. And they'll read the same verse and be split over it to the point they'll split churches and, you know, fight each other. And 
And really, the Word of God means one thing. It doesn't mean 57 different things. It means one thing. Every verse means one thing. It's not open to private interpretation. It means what God, it means what God meant in the context when He said it, and it doesn't mean anything else. Well, the Holy Spirit, see, God was so good to us, and I know this is review, it's okay. We're, we're headed somewhere, trust me, somewhere new. God is so good to not only give us a book, but to also give us a teacher to explain the book. And that teacher is not Dave Roberson, although he's a great teacher. It's not Gary Carpenter, even though I'm a teacher. It's my office. No, your true teacher is the Holy Ghost himself. And, oh, what a great day. What a wonderful tool as an engineer. When I found out that praying in tongues was a tool that God had given us, that at my own will, just like, you know, I can take a wrench anytime I want and work on my car. I don't, but I could. <laughs> what I'm saying is I had that tool is available to me, and it's up to me whether I use it. Tongues is exactly like that. It's a tool God has put in your, in your uh, toolbox, your spiritual toolbox. I want to understand God's Word. Use the tool. Pray in tongues. Read the Word. You know? And then not only was it to explain the Word, I found out, he also starts examining our hearts, and really, let's say our conscience, let's say more than that, our soul. The part of us, some might call it the flesh, the part of us that's not yet renewed to think like him. Well, the Holy Spirit, you know, he'll start going through as you, as you yield time to him. You say you want to change, do you? Oh yeah, I want to change. Well, here's a tool. Just spend time praying in other tongues. Let the Holy Spirit begin opening doors that you slammed shut so long ago. You don't even let your mother look in there. You don't let your wife look in there. You don't even look in there yourself anymore. Why? Because it's too ugly what's in there. It's a big old stronghold. I mean, you slam that door shut. You don't go near it. Big keep out sign. Two befores nailed across it. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit, as you pray, eventually he's going to come to what door? You know, hey, look in these other doors. No, you're okay there. I'm looking in this one. Two befores come flying off and the door comes open. You go, ow, don't look in there. And he goes, I'm looking in there. Oh, don't look in there. And that's what we call an impasse. You know, you, like Dave says, the most horrible thing about prayer is when you meet yourself. <laughs> I, remember the, I remember that cartoon of Pogo from when, way back at about the end of World War II, you know. The, this cartoon, and then they'd reshow it every now and then. Pogo was a comic strip for you youngsters years ago. But he says, he come back and he had a report. He says, I have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> You're, I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to trying to, to, to live more holy and live, walk the love walk and all of that. And, but thank God. God loved us too much, and he gave us a tool the Holy Spirit himself, if you'll use the tool, he'll begin opening those doors. And, and the first part is horrible. You see that ugly thing? You say, I'm not like that, am I? And you go ask your friends, I'm not like that. And we all go, yeah, you are. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, just the only one, you're just the one that found out about it. We knew and loved you anyway up until now. You know? <laughs> but then, through the other tools that he's given us, and I'm not going to review them all. We'd be here the whole hour just on this. Well, how do you deal with it? Well, sometimes it's going to be fasting. Sometimes it's going to be uh, confession. But he's given us all of these tools and stronghold. It's a perfect type and shadow from the Old Testament. The abundant life, that promised land is a type and shadow of the abundant life. And the abundant life, if you want to know what that's really a type and shadow of, it's the life of Christ in you. The more that you are able to walk that walk, as he, as he is, so am I in this world. The more that we're able to purge ourselves from the old man and then walk like this new man, that is the abundant life. Well, have me you know, he's not sick. He's not broke. He's not sad and depressed. He's not on, what is it, Prozac? He's not on... <laughs> and if you're taking things, I'm not saying throw away your medicine either. I'm saying get healed. Use the tools, see? And, okay, and then in my own Christian life, I mean, I'll just tell you, to this point, I've been at this a while, 32 years now. I mean, I have had to take God's Word and put it in my mouth right in the face of sickness that looked like it was going to kill me. And you've got to make a choice, you know. Well, what's right here? I mean, the doctors, and the, they gave me six months to live, about 1990, with uh, melanoma cancer, said I had about six months. 
And that's pretty, you know, easy to believe that. There's the doctor standing there. Plus, I have the thing on my chest, a big old melanoma blob there. And it sure looks angry, and I'm going to kill you, you know. <laughs> and it's easy to believe that. But what, what does God's Word say? What is faith? What does God say? Well, pick your verses. I mean, by His stripes I am healed. He blesses my bread. He blesses my water. He takes sickness away from the midst of me. Himself carried my pains and bore my infirmities. You can just go on and on. And I, right in the face, I learned, Michael taught us this early on. Faith says what God says. And it doesn't say anything else. Anything other than that is unbelief. Hmm. Faith says what God says. Well, did you ever find Romans 12? If you haven't found it by now, just look on. <laughs> well, these services that have been coming through everybody, Alan, Mark, myself, we're about to come into revival, people. And these services are almost, they're being orchestrated by an unseen hand. I mean, Alan is gone for weeks and comes back and preaches like he's heard every message. You know, it's just right back like, okay, you know. Fits perfectly like a pieces of the puzzle with what Mark's teaching, what I'm teaching. And I'm looking at this trying to get a, what's, what are you doing, God? And he showed me plainly. Man, we're, we're about to go where few have gone in history. We're about to, and you're part of this now. When I say we, I mean ye. <laughs> We, collectively, are about to go into a revival like has not been seen, really, since the book of Acts. Since the book of Acts. Signs and wonders. And what God is doing in these, this last period, we're like, okay, we're down to the, the, we're, the finish line is almost in sight now. And he is determined to purge us of any impurities, any weaknesses, any handles, any strongholds. I'm not trying to get the right words here. Anything in us. That the enemy could use to destroy you and discredit the revival and bring it down. And I mean, it's, it's an all-out assault. I have never in my life seen such assaults on marriages. The counseling that Sue and I have been doing lately. And if you think I'm talking about you, yes, I probably am and others that you don't know about. You know, if I talk to you, you know, trying to look everywhere so I'm not looking anywhere. <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> And to, today, this week, I finished a, a project that I might be 32 years late on. But I'm going to, it's going to make it available free to you. It's one more tool that you can use. Well, the essence of these messages has changed. So Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. We say body in Tulsa. Bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And Alan was teaching on that and how you put your body on the, on the altar and whether it's, it's not just fasting, but that's one of the tools, another tool God gave us to help you do that. And then just saying no to your body about anything is another tool, you know. My body don't like to ever be told no. But anyway... But that's part of the process of be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, and then here comes Mark Jenkins, and God's given him revelation on 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and the, the letter to Jude, warning the early church about false teachers that were going to bring in promiscuous grace. They don't call it that. They call it ultimate grace. Where you can just do anything you want, live any way you want, and you'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Ask Sodom and Gomorrah about that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ask, ask Egypt who... Egypt. Don't ask Egypt. Ask Israel. Israel, after they were delivered out of Egypt, they disobeyed God. But they, they, they all lived in the promised land. They were fine. They lived the abundant life, right? And it says God destroyed them in the wilderness. Ultimate grace is a big trap in the last days. Now. We, you are saved by grace. Don't you get that wrong. But if you think you can... Get saved and live like a dog and make heaven. They are teaching you error. And that book that says 1 John chapter 1 does not belong to Christians is I, the guy has probably got a good heart. I see a lot of good things in the man's writings, but I'm telling you that is false doctrine. 
as strong as I know how. That is false doctrine. It's going to send a lot of people to hell, and I know that he would be mortified to know that. But that's the truth anyway. I'm not going to say who it is here, but anyway. Most of you know anyway. Well, how though? See, I'm reading this. What? Okay. But I, want to put, I want to put my body on the altar. I want to, I, want to I, I have to some degree, those of you that know me, you can tell. And, but I want to put it more on the altar, see? Well, how, how, is there a way that we can do that even more? Or did you, I, you can go ahead and turn to Ephesians 4 real quick. The, these are the verses that in this past year especially God's been bringing out. Romans 12, 1 and 2 and Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 through 24 are just almost identical. They're saying exactly the same thing. One is written to people in the Roman letter. That's written to gen, uh, people who understand the law. This letter to the Ephesians, these people were worshiping Diana before Paul came. I mean, these are, these are just Gentiles, you know, and they don't know anything about the law, really. But yet Paul says to them almost exactly the same thing. And he writes it here in Ephesians 4, verses 20, starting in verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, <clears throat> the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. God, I love how that's worded. You have a spiritual mind. There is, you know, Dave has taught us from the rich man and Lazarus and how they both went to hell. And Dave went through there line by line and showing us, you know, okay, now we know that a rich man, or let's say it this way, your spirit, the spirit, we know it has tips of fingers. Y'all remember that teaching? We know that it has a tongue. We know that it has eyes. Well, if it has all of those things, it's got all the rest of the parts. Your spirit has a mind. It's encased right now within your, like Alan was teaching, within your chemically based natural brain. But it's a different mind than the mind that's in your soul. Okay? Okay, that brings me to another verse. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Here is the problem, people. Or one of the problems. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. You are not who you think you are. We are not who we think we are collectively. And if we are just going to keep on, you know, what's that definition of insanity? To keep doing the same thing and expect different results. If we don't do something different than the rest of the church is doing, the church at large, nobody's resisting revival. Well, most people are not resisting revival. We're not going to have it either. We have got to change. We have got to be transformed. And my question to God again is, how? I've been praying until my lips roll across the floor sometimes, you know, fasting, and we've been doing all of this for a long time. They only gave me one more little tool here that we can use if we want to use it. What is it? I'll get to it in a few minutes. <laughs> but see, the problem is, is we're not who we think we are. We're still, the, the phrase living by faith keeps evolving for me as I get older, as I get more, I mean, oh, I don't mean physically older, which, I mean older in Christ as I mature in him at one time living by faith was trying to just survive financially day to day meal to meal <laughs> trying to live by faith you know then there was the time of the trying to stay alive because the doctor said I had to die and so living by faith was trying to stay alive you know and, and finding God's truth and overcoming I mean I have quoted his word in the face of lack I've quoted his word in the face of six months death sentence I've and others here could give testimony of the same. But really, living by faith, what he's really after is for us to live like who he says we are. And quit believing our own definition of who we are. And I'm finding that's to be the hardest thing of all. It's harder than any of them that I've done before. Why? Because I am so intimately acquainted with all of my failures, all of my shortcomings, all of my thoughts that, God, how can I even be saved and think some of those thoughts, you know? What are they? Same probably ones you have. I don't know. <laughs> Get angry. Glad your thoughts aren't arrows. Anyway, Hebrews 4, see, we're never going to know who we are by, by experience. We're never going to know who we are by 
uh, asking your neighbors. There's only one way to find out who you really are. And it's given here to us in Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick, it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, now here's the part, piercing even to the, to the, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul, notice, soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The part I want to focus on. You want to know who you are? Only the word of God has the power to come and separate you into two, two halves. This is your spirit. This is your soul. You are at your core made in the image of God. We didn't finish Ephesians 4. Don't turn back there. Let me just read it to you. Our, it says, Put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is a corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God, that means in God's image, is created, created from the get-go in righteousness and true holiness. That is who you are. That is who you are. And I'm, you say, well, I know that. I've heard that. No, we, we don't know that. We don't. We're still living with the mindset, whether we like it or not. If Jesus was here, God would use him to do that. Jesus is here in you, created in righteousness and holiness. The new nature is in you. Whatever you ask in my name, he says, I, 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 I will do it. The only reason where he's not doing it is because we don't believe. Even though theologically we say we do. But we don't. But we do. But we don't. And even when we try, we finally get enough gumption to go pray for that person at Walmart with the wheelchair. I'm not the only one that's done it. And I hope the one you prayed for got up and run off. The one I prayed for didn't. And neither did the next one or the next one. You know, they might have got it. Anyway. That, my brothers and sisters is not God's plan. God's plan is when you pray, it is with no less authority and no less faith, no less power than if Jesus himself walked up in the flesh, which you are his flesh, and laid his hand or commanded that person, just the same thing you read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that person should rise up healed just like it did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The only reason it's not happening, it's, God, it's not God, it's us. So how do we change? How do we really do this that Romans 12, 1 and 2 and Ephesians 4, how do we, is there another tool? Is there something we can do? Well, the only the word of God, the point of Hebrews 4, 12 is we're not going to do it without the word of God. The word of God is the only one that can really tell you who you are. Okay? Now, once you find out who you are, your soul is going to have to make a transition. Just hearing it once, hearing it two or three times a week, can you tell that it's not been working? <laughs> what I mean is we're not in revival. And by the way, I get some, uh, you know, nice, let's see, I don't want to be too unkind. I'll just make my guarantee again onto the worldwide audience. If you're sitting there and you're going to write me ugly letters and tell me that you're already arrived, I will personally pay for your airline tickets to New York City. I will put you in a nice hotel. I'll pay all the bills if you can lay your hand on Tommy Perez and get him out of the wheelchair. Now until then, shut up. Get in, get in the class with the rest of us and let's make this change. Let's make this change, okay? Hey, I'm all for it. If you can do it, glory to God, I'll pay the way and I'll sit down and you teach me. I'm, I mean, I am teachable. But until, and I don't mean by, okay, you know, anything can happen by the gifts. But God wants this as a, this should be a place where every, every day, not, and trust me, it won't be Sunday and Wednesday then. Every day, when that revival breaks out, I mean, you'll be begging for a little cot in the corner just to catch an hour's nap. 
in between because the healing multi they'll be coming are you kidding and it won't be just Christians coming it'll be Muslims it'll be Jews it'll be Hindu it'll be Buddhist if you can get their mama healed if you can get their kids healed if you can empty out the children and then it won't just happen here it's not this place it's you it's us it's Christ in us is the hope of glory and he's gonna send like I can just see those revival fires he's gonna scatter us around the world and everywhere you land a fire revival will break out but that's not gonna happen unless we do something different than what we've been doing well, this is just one tool. This is not the answer. It's another tool. You've already got a big old toolbox. You know, God, Dave's been real good to give us tools. Uh, what we call the message. Okay? But I'm going to give you one here in a minute. It's another one. All right? Go to Romans 10 now. Now, once you find out, you know, you take the Word of God and, and you use it like that, like it says there, and the Word of God begins like a sword. It's going to cut you in half in a good way. It's going to start telling you who you really are, see? Who you are. You are that spirit. You are that new man. You are created. The real you is made in the image of Jesus. Turn to somebody and say that. The real me is made in the image of Jesus. As he is, so am I in this world. God's purpose was to have many brethren conform to the image of Christ. I'm one of those brethren. Look at me. Don't I look like him? And in your spirit you do. You do. Mm. I like this. Now Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 10. This is just such... I just want to just... Touch base here with this one. I thank God for this verse. Without this verse, I would not be here today. Without this verse that Michael Muccio, who's sitting in the audience today, love you, man. Without this verse, he saved my life with this verse. He pounded us in a loving way. <laughs> this, is what, this is what faith is. Faith believes what God says. No matter what you think about it, no matter how you feel about it, faith believes what God says and he taught us he says out of Rome he says faith has two parts faith always has two parts most people try and operate in faith and they're only using half of faith but look with the heart man believes unto righteousness but with the and with the mouth with the mouth confession is made unto salvation that word there is soteria, salvation, soteria, which comes from the root word sozo. And it means saved in any way that you need saving. When the blind man saw, he got sozoed. When the woman with the issue of blood got healed, she got sozoed. When you got born again, you, your spirit got sozoed. But it's always this way. I found every victory, every stronghold. I started to say a while ago, the type and shadow from the Old Testament... Stronghold by stronghold. God didn't give them the whole land in a single day. He said, no, it's stronghold or say city by city. Stronghold by stronghold. You possess the land. And I found it to be exactly that way. Stronghold by stronghold. And man, we could go around the room and give testimonies of people that have conquered all kinds of stuff. I mean, we could go from physical healing. We could go to rejection. We could go to depression. We could go to finances. We could go to all these different things. Just, you know, but every one of us has had our, our time conquering in this promised land. We've all got, we, you know, I can, we all got strongholds behind us that have been conquered. And if we're honest, we see strongholds up ahead that need to be conquered. Okay? Well, let's conquer them. <laughs> see? Well, yes, Brother Gary, thank you. How? Well, I'm glad you came today. We're going to give a big part of the how. First, a big part of the how is first this verse right here, Romans 10.10. 10. See, if it hadn't have been for this verse, the devil would have talked me out of my own salvation. Because in my living room, 4th of July, about 2 in the morning, 1980, nobody else was there. I bowed my knee and I, I did the sinner's prayer. And nothing. I had nothing. I, there's no rush of emotions. No heaven did not open with a beam of light shining down. I didn't feel the brush of an angel's wing. I mean, it was the deadest, driest thing I ever did in my life. And, the, and I heard a voice just as clear, just as clear. I know now for sure it was the devil. And he says, 
it didn't work for you. You've done too much. You had your chance, you know. He's done with you. You're not saved. And I heard it just as plain. If it had not been for this verse, Romans 10, verse 10, that Michael lovingly had given me over and over and over again, says, listen, you believe what God says. With the heart man believes and with the mouth, he says, with the mouth, confession is made unto. I have found that to be, in my own life, I've got to shorten this up some. Now, in my own life, I had to battle three days over my own salvation because I remembered what Michael said. And I said, look here, devil. And I'd back up in that same chapter. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you believe God raised Christ from the dead and confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, thou shalt be saved. And I'm going, I don't matter whether I feel like I'm saved or not. I'm saved because the word says I'm saved. Well, that was just my first one. And it was three days before I ever got any emotions. I'm glad I finally got them. But I was saved just as much the first day as I was the third day. But I have found in my Christian walk... The process never changes. I don't care what it is you're believing God for. I remember when our lovely children were a little wayward. <laughs> They're sitting right over there now. And they were all free in rebellion at the same time. Angie always says, I was the least rebellious. Angie always says that. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> well, it was the same thing. We had to find what... what you, are there any promises in God's word concerning your children? You bet there is. We found those verses. We got them in our heart. And then we got them in our mouth. And we would just spend time confessing God's word, confessing God's word. And it got to the point, you know, the world would say, we'd lie to you. We weren't lying. You say, how are your kids doing? And we knew they were in the bars. We knew they were running around. We could tell you, you know, we knew in the natural all kinds of stuff. But it it got in our heart in abundance. You know, you'd say, well, how, how are they doing? Our daughters are the handmaidens of the Lord. They prophesy in Jesus' name. They lay hands on the sick and they recover. They cast out devils. <gasps> and they, <laughs> they're, they're faithful and true unto him. How long do you want to stand there? We'll just keep telling you what God says about our daughters. And sure enough, it came to pass. Amen. Glory to God. Well, what does he say about your sickness? What does he say about depression? What does he say about anything? It's always, I found it's always the same. First, I got to get his word. I got to find out what he says. That's faith coming. Then I got to get it in my heart. Well, one way you do that is speak it. You can't speak it over and over again. It doesn't start having an effect on you. And then you got to start saying it out of your mouth exactly like it's so. <laughs> Like it's already so. God calls those things which be not as though they were. Mm. When the earth was form, no, no, no. when the earth was without form and darkness covered the face of the deep, the mountain was darkness. What was not? What was not was light. So what did God call? Light be. Light was. You call his health. You call his prosperity. You call Everything you believe in the heart and you say what he says right in the face of the circumstances. Truth changes fact. His word is truth. Those facts. Now, I do know Ronald Reagan said facts are stubborn things. (laughs) And they are. But truth will change your facts. See, God's word does not change. Facts do. Hmm. Anyway. All right. I... (laughs) Yes, sir. Get him in those days. All right. It's time to introduce this now. Years ago, within the first few months of when Sue and I got saved, we attended a camp meeting, and I bought a little book. I bought, actually, I bought all their books. Uh, Sue and I, in those days, were doing pretty well financially. And I had never heard things like I was hearing at that conference. And so, uh, you know, they had a book and tape selling area. A lot of books and tapes, all different things, you know. And I just walked up and I said, well, how much? And he said, well, which one do you want? And I said, well, how much for them all? He said, well, nobody ever asked me that. I don't know. He said, <laughs> I said, well, figure it up. And I think it was about $800 at the time. It was $1980. Anyway, I just, we just bought it all. And Sue will tell you, now, I am a good student. Anybody that knows me, I am a good student. I devoured those books and tapes and devoured them over and over again until I can still today. I can almost quote them. I was listening to an old tape the other day by that same preacher I bought those books and tapes from. I was listening to a tape I probably haven't heard in 25 years. And I would stop it and I would say the next sentence and then play it to see for sure if that's what he said. Sure enough, I could still do it. 
I don't have a photographic memory. That's, that's from doing it over and over and over and over again where it's in me like my blood. Just in me, okay? Well, one of the books that I bought was a little dollar book. And I should have done this probably 32 years ago. I thought about it and just never day. Anyone ever think about doing a good thing and 30, 32 years go by? Oh, not, thir- not yet. <laughs> I should have done it then. But this little book was called In Him. Anyone ever see that little blue book? By the way, you can buy it online, the digital version for a dollar. And you can put it in your iBooks if you have an iPhone. Uh, just do In Him a search. Don't do it right now, please. <laughs> I, see, I see phones coming out. <laughs> please wait till the end of the service. <laughs> it's like 99 cents, you know. But anyway, uh, it's called In Him. And he doesn't list all of... Well, yeah, in the course of the book, he does list all of these scriptures. And uh, he took a few of them. And he says, really, you know, this is everything we are in him. Now, I've got to be honest with you. 32 years ago, as I was reading that book and listening to messages along that line, it, it meant something to me. I thought, boy, that's really good. That's who I am in him? Huh. You know, and I... But fast forward 32 years... You know what the difference is now as I look at these? After all the revelation knowledge. See, then I just had to take it by faith or take it on trust that he knew what he was talking about. Now, after all the revelation knowledge all these years, I read those same verses and I know why. I know why it's true. We're not in Adam anymore. We are in him. That means that that new nature, just like the same way you received an Adam a nature of Adam at your first birth. It wasn't his spirit. It wasn't Adam's personal spirit. But you received the nature of that fallen spirit. And it, did you notice it had an effect on you? It had an effect on you, didn't it? Caused you to operate not in the best way. Well, when you got born again, the real you died. I mean, the real old you died to death. You were crucified with Christ in the place of Adam on that cross. And then God, he put a new spirit on the inside of you. He, he quickened you to new life, just like Jesus coming out of the grave. But your spirit went from death to life. And that spirit on the inside of us now is not of Adam anymore. You're not in Adam. You are of Christ. You are in him. You know, it dawned on me one day. One day. That scene in the garden after Adam and Eve fell and they're hiding in the shrubbery. And God finds them and they finally come out. And, and Adam, of course, you know, just like, he blamed his wife. It's a woman you gave me. That, that didn't, by the way, man, that didn't work then. It's not going to work now. You know. Of course, she blamed the devil. None of us have ever done that. But really, the devil didn't make them fall. They chose it. But the part I want to get to is after, after all, that whole conversation, then God, he slays an animal. First death recorded in the Bible. First physical death recorded in the Bible. He slays an animal. And he put that, that coat like a type of Christ, you know. I mean, that's a type of the lamb that would be slain. He put that, the, the skin of that animal over them. And it dawned on me one day. The, the whole human race at that moment was in the loins of Adam and so was I did you know that thousands of years before you were born God has already extended his grace to you because you were in Adam on that day now if we can get that same revelation you when Christ was raised from the dead, now if you'll allow me, it's a little different. You were in the spiritual loins of Christ. When he was raised from the dead, no less than you were in the physical loins of Adam when he fell. Everything that Jesus has received is yours. Because you are in him. If, 
God crowns him with a robe. Crowns him with a robe. If God places a robe upon his shoulders, can you see it's no different than in the garden? That robe is just as much on you. You meditate right there for a while and you're going to be different. Hmm. That's good right there. That was free, by the way. There's no extra charge for that. Well, what I, what I intended to do then, I have finally done. In that little book of In Him, he has all of these scriptures. And it's all of the verses that, you know, in Christ, I have that separated by sections. Well, what I did that I, that I you know, he had a, like four or five of them done for us in the book that this preacher did. But the rest of them he just listed. And the thought went through my mind 32 years ago, you know, I ought to go through there and get all of those and make a positive confession. 32 years later, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and now print it out this is going to be available for you at the website print it out it's 26 pages and you know single space for the most part 26 pages and <clears throat> I'm going to say a few things about this and really I'm going to have it here in two, I'm going to have it at the website in two forms you'll be able to print them out one of the they're going to be PDFs one of them is already there and it's called the In Him Scriptures in him scriptures that is the verses themselves separated by category in Christ in him by whom uh, in his name and all of those things that's so you can print out your own just the verses without my confessions because listen there's nothing magical or special about the, the way I say them I've just tried to do it to give you a heads up or give you a start or if if you don't have time to do them yourself you can use these okay but really what's best is you, how does how does that how do you say that now for example turn to Romans 3:24 i want to give you a, a few examples here anyway i said they're in two forms one of them is just the scriptures the other one will be this one and it's it'll be called the in him one will be called in him scriptures this one is called in him confessions okay and feel free to print it out what I hope to do, though, uh, on the first, the first page of these, you're going to see my confessions are pretty long. The rest of it, they're fairly short. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank all of the people that helped me proofread this, that helped me uh, modify some of the confessions. Uh, I don't, it's, I'd forget somebody if I tried to list all of you, but thank you so much. And what's amazing is one would find this one, this spelling error, one would find that typo, somebody else would find that. Didn't have a whole lot of duplicates, so I thank God for all of the help. And there may still be some typos. Have mercy. We'll have, you have mercy on us, we'll have mercy on you. We're doing the best we can here. Romans 3.24 is a very short verse. <clears throat> it says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus okay um, you look up that word redemption one of the best definitions that helps me is one of the uh, authors redemption means cleared by payment you know it's cleared by payment you came to redeem it maybe you, you uh, had something hocked at a uh, what do you call them a pawn shop pawn shop and then later on you come and you redeem that you've got it back and it's been cleared by payment you didn't get it without payment well the simplest confession there if you were wanting to say that about yourself you can just say <clears throat> I am and by the way I am should become your best friend he taught me decades ago the best confessions have I am in them I am not I will be I am who is God he is the great I am who, who are we we are his children I am say this I am who God says I am that's what we're doing here okay so say this I am justified <clears throat> freely by his grace I am justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and that's simple enough that alone is powerful 
if you were to start saying that and saying that where it, it dawns on you. But now, as you do that and as you meditate on it, it's going to become more meaningful to you. Flavors of it begin coming to your mind. Now, for example, this is my version so far. A year from now, it'll probably be expanded beyond this. Okay? This is mine. Now, again, I'm just going to read the verse, then I'm going to give that. The verse says, Romans 3.24, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I say, I have been declared just in the sight of God. I am redeemed by grace alone. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't pay the price. It was free to me. Notice it says freely. It was free to me. Jesus paid a terrible price to redeem me. Redemption means I have been cleared by payment. Jesus took my guilt and paid the price in full with his own blood. I am justified because of payment in full. No accusations against me have any legal standing before God. Now when the enemy starts browbeating you over all of your failures and all of your faults, now see, I am a firm believer in 1 John 1, 9. If you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Not only to forgive us, but to also cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But see, if you do that, this verse belongs to you again. That's what drives the devil crazy. That's what drives the devil nuts. He is the accuser of the brethren. But the truth is, Jesus paid the price to clear you in full. No accusation against you. Now, he'll, if you let him, he'll torment your mind. You'll be on Prozac. And again, I don't want to just pick on people. You'll be on antidepressants yourself. If you let him torment your mind, feed your mind this. Feed your mind this. So believe this. Say it. Just here. I'll, I'll keep it short. Say it with me. I have been declared just in the sight of God. I am redeemed by grace alone. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't pay the price. It was free to me. But Jesus paid a terrible price to redeem me. Redemption means I have been cleared by payment. Jesus took my guilt and paid the price in full with his own blood. I am justified because of payment in full. No accusations against me have any legal standing before God. I'm telling you that verse right there, just that one. You walk around and say that where it gets in your heart in abundance, you're going to be a different human being. You're, that depression and guilt and self doubt and wavering, all of that will start vanishing like a snowball in the August sunshine, which is pretty quick in Oklahoma in August. Let's do another one. How about go over to Romans 8? Anyone ever hear of any verses in Romans 8? Look at verses 1 and 2. See, the walking by faith that God is calling us to now. Yes, we still, we teach people how to walk in health, how to walk in God's prosperity, how to walk in this and that. But really what he's calling us to do is walk as he walked. He's calling us to really finally believe what, what the gospel teaches, that God has purified a people unto himself, made us in the image of Christ. We do not have to sin anymore. And we, we can walk as he walked talk as he talked and have the same results that he had. And that's what he said. Those that believe, 
They'll do the same works and even greater works. That's us. All right. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Now, you know the verses here. Let me read them. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, here's my version. Again, you know, you, please, you're free to write your own version. I am free from condemnation. I am, you don't have to repeat after me, yes. <laughs> you want to? You better hear it first. No, you better hear it first. I don't want you to say anything that you don't know what's coming. So let me just quote it. It says, I am free from condemnation. I am in Christ Jesus. I no longer walk after the fallen nature of the flesh. I now walk by the righteous nature of Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, emanating from my reborn spirit, cancels the curse and has made me free from the law of sin and death. Is that good stuff or what? You say, yeah, but I'm not walking that way, Gary. I am walking after the flesh. What? How do I say this? You mean you're not perfect? What? Anyone ever hear of that? Honey, you're just doing something different than that one's doing, and that one's doing something different than that one's doing. And there's all different measures. I mean, some sins, you know, are hard to hide. You know, Sue and I kept the Febreze company in, in business by ourselves during those smoking years because... It was hard to hide, you know, and I said, Sue, they can smell it anyway. She didn't matter to her, pachu, 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 you know, she's spraying me, you know. But you can get free of those kind of sins and, and still be a worrier. Worry for Christians is a sin. I'm sorry, it is. It's called unbelief. It's no trust. You know, I don't care what God said. I'm going to worry about this. I don't believe he's going to take care of me. I'm going to worry. Now, leave me alone. Let me worry. But I'm not sinning. What? Well, those are easy to hide, you know. I mean, you can talk nice in church. Nobody knows you go home and worry all the time. But what I'm saying is, honey, join the, join the rest of us. We're all dealing with stuff. This is a tool to get you past the stuff. See? All right? Let's just, instead, of, instead of confessing these, see, I don't want to take up the time today. I, I want to hit a few of these. And I want you... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I almost forgot. Now, listen. Most of you are able to print these out at home, most of you. If you don't have a computer and a printer at home, you probably have a friend who does, and that would be a lot faster to get your friend to do it. But now if you're listening to me and you do not have a computer, and you don't have any way, you don't have any friends, we're praying for you, <laughs> you don't have any friends that are friend enough to print it for you, if you ask them. If you really need a printed copy, you can email Gary Carpenter Ministries, P.O. Box 9667, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74157. We will print you out a set and mail them to you free. Post its page. You will not be on a mailing list. We will not start sending you monthly requests for money or anything else. Okay? But if you, if you really need it, I don't want you not to have this. You can have it. Okay? So, anyway, not repeating it again. You can rewind. And <laughs> let's go to a... Let's, yes, sir. I want to do this one. 1 Corinthians... Chapter 1. This is especially a good verse for self-righteousness. See, he is trying to get it across to us that we are righteous. But there's a big difference between righteousness, which is free by grace, and righteousness, which is of the law. You start thinking you're something special, and you'll start judging other people around you, now you become a Pharisee. Okay? All right? He wants you to believe you're righteous because he made you righteous. But boy, it's not based on your good works. Not even based on... Well, anyway, I don't want to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. Now, the verses say this. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as, as it is written he that glorieth 
let him glory in the Lord. I've really meditated on this one a while now. I, I like this one. It is all God's work that I am in Christ Jesus. God made Jesus my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, and my redemption. I had no part to play in my salvation. I have nothing to boast about. I only have the right to be thankful and to make my boast in the Lord. Is that good? See, I like that. It reminds me every time I say it. I deserved hell. On my own, I would go there without a doubt. It certainly wasn't my work in any way that made me a child of God. It was because of His love. Because of His grace. The fact that I get to go to this church and hear the things that I hear. I figure surely I must be His pet. But the last thing He wants me to do is become a judge of others. Become self-righteous Pharisee. He wants me to make the servant. He wants to make us the servant of the most evil people on earth. Did you hear that? He died for the, un, for the ungodly. Well, there's 26 pages here. Okay. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. <laughs> this is on page 15. <laughs> well, of the confessions, not your Bible. I only got two minutes, two minutes left, you know. I just want to give you a flavor. And what I want you to do, print these out. Begin to say them. Start getting them. It's not, I'll be honest with you, it's not the saying them, really. That It starts there. It starts there. But the real key is once this gets in your heart in abundance, then you really can't say anything else. It becomes you like your blood is you. It becomes you. You you can't talk any other way. You can't really act any other way. It is you. Hmm. So Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here's my confession on it. Here's the way I wrote it. And help from others. That God is my Father who brought Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, again from the dead. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, he makes me perfect in every good work. Who does? He makes me perfect in every good work. And I do his will. God is working in me that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Father, I give you glory forever and ever. Amen. i got about one minute. I want to read you this. One thing you're going to find as you go through this, you're going to be declaring yourself righteous and holy and, and all of those things, which is... That's dividing now between spirit and soul. Everything he's saying there, you're not lying because what you're really confessing is who you are in your spirit. But what you're going to find is you're going to find dark rooms of the soul, just like when you prayed in tongues and you're going to be going, Oh God, oh God, oh God, my life does not line up with that. I need to change. Here's a wonderful passage. You just make, make don't turn, you can turn to it if you want to. We're going to be about a minute over. It's Jeremiah 3. Old Testament. Verses 14 through 23. Listen, if this was his heart in the Old Testament to people who were not even his children, this is to backsliders. This is his heart towards you. So Jeremiah 3, starting in verse 14, says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will give you pastors according to my heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. It shall come to pass that when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall no more say, The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind. 
Neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither will they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They shall come together out of the land of the north to the land I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of the nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father and shall not turn away from me. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. 1 John 1, 9. Return. I don't care if you, why you're fighting whatever it is you're fighting. If you have to go there 20 times, 30 times a day. Return. Behold, we have come unto thee. For thou art the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. That's talking about idols. And from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. You're going to find as you confess these things. Your conscience is going to start becoming condemned. Because your spirit who you really are is not lining up with your soul at this present time in your actions return unto him don't run from him run to him and I mean if you have to go 20 times 30 times a day run to him First John 1 9 and say Father Father I return again help me forgive me keep doing the things that will one day result in your freedom he will walk through hell with you as you do that We'll see you in 30 minutes.